So in the first video, I went over the basics behind asset classes and the theory behind the efficient frontier. In this video, I'm going to cover diversification, risk levels and investment structures. Some may say you really should have planned your episodes better so they don't have to be two parters, and to that I say how dare you. In this video, I'm going to go over the main things you need to know with understanding your investments. So diversification. Diversification is considered the only free lunch in investing. And if you want my thoughts in more detail on this, and there's a long read on my website discussing Warren Buffett's recent airline experience and what it teaches about diversification. If you like topics like that, sign up to my mailing list, a weekly article and no spam over. The reason for diversification and why it gets the tag of the only free lunch investing is it can increase the probability of expected returns while reducing risk. Diversification is a really broad topic and because it can be across asset classes, geographies, even sectors and factor tills. So a starting point before going into a multi-factor approach is just to think about asset pricing models starting with these two main types of risk. Systematic risk, which is the risk that you can't diversify away from. It's the risk of the market, it's beta. This is what you take on in expecting a positive return, it's the getting paid for the uncertainty. Then there's this non-systematic risk or idiosyncratic risk, specific risk, which you can remove by diversification. The thing to bear in mind is that the concentration by itself isn't a price risk. So owning one company may provide you a good outcome, but the concentration element isn't a risk that we would expect a positive return from based on the theory or the evidence. You may achieve a good return by over-concentrating your investments, but it's not a priced risk. The market doesn't price as a result of the concentration. So does that mean that someone who loads up on one share and does incredibly well has made a bad investment? Well, I guess it depends on how you define your decision-making process with foresight as opposed to with hindsight. Because we're ultimately making a decision now and not with hindsight going forward which is why the phrase past performance is not a reliable guide to future returns is thrown around so much because it is just that. As far as the decision-making process, it's important to separate an anecdote, which is basically a story with little factual academic evidence to back it up, and the theory or empirical evidence helps build a framework to use going forward. So let's look at geographies. The thing is that countries tend to have periods of out and under performance relative to the general global market, which is the case for global diversification. In 1900, the UK was 25% of the global stock market. Now it's 5.1. The US was 15%, now it's 54.5. During that period, Japan came super popular and not so much. Just to put it into global perspective, in September 2020, Apple as a single company became more valuable by market capitalization than the entire FTSE. If I'm being honest, one of the big reasons of setting up this channel was to hopefully provide a bit more of a rational voice about these things. There are tons of channels out there which just go out from flat misinformation to some really well-meaning stuff, but can be quite damaging. So it's like, here's why I'm buying and stock market crash, time to sell, whatever. And look, I think it's great to be really passionate about investing and anyone investing for their future is doing a great thing. And I'm hugely supportive of that. So please know this comes from the right place, but I think it's just important to know and to look at the stats when being aware of some of those individual choices you might have, for example, on stocks. In Henrik Bessenbeiner's paper in 2019, do global stocks outperform treasury bills? Treasury bills are considered a risk-free asset and as there were short-term treasuries in this example, which comparatively have low risk, low return. So he found when researching nearly 62,000 global stocks from 1990 to 2018, 56% of the US stock market and 61% of the non-US stock market underperformed treasury bills over the full sample. So from 1990 to 2018, that amount of stocks did not outperform a risk-free asset. In fact, 1.33% of firms accounted for all net global wealth creation. So let's think, 1.3% firms basically did the heavy lifting for the entire market during that period. It's a statistical version of choosing a needle or a haystack. So risk levels. Long term, the biggest determinant of your returns expected to be your asset allocation, basically what you're invested in. So I start this video talking about risk and return. Well, investments are fundamentally priced value of cash flow of businesses or government profits, value or debt, so obligations. They are looking forward, so they're making a pricing guess about future expectation. That estimate is crucial to understand as the expectation about the future that's gonna change because after all, the world changes. It is totally rational for there to be changes in the world outlook when say a large part of the banking system has decided to leverage up on the financial equivalent of magic beans or a virus has come out of nowhere and changed the way we live our lives. 
This is really key to understand because with expectations changing, which we can't predict, they can change back. And using history as our guide, while what happened in the past isn't necessarily what's gonna happen in the future, over time in a capitalist system, it is expected that businesses and governments as a whole will overcome challenges. It's expected they'll continue to buy and sell things from each other. Short term, the market is a voting machine. Long term, it is a weighing machine. So volatility is not a pleasant experience. But it should be expected that every so often there will be changes in those cash flow expectations. One of the key things I would suggest, especially if you're doing this on your own and without the support of a financial planner, is to understand your own risk tolerance. And I mean that. Have an honest conversation with yourself and try and establish the level of volatility you'd be okay with and try and prepare yourself. Try and expect it with an idea of when it happens, it won't be a surprise and you'll be much less likely to make a panic decision. Because trust me, when it hits the fan, you don't rise to the occasion, you sink to the level of your training. So risk and volatility is a spectrum. And as we can see from Vanguard, which can be used as a broad guide, as a fair generalization, the higher you go up on the risk scale for a portfolio, the higher amount of equities you can hold, as risk is generally defined by volatility. Now, whether risk should be defined as volatility is another topic. And I'm gonna go into the nature of this risk in more detail in another video. But as you can see, as you start to move down the risk scale, the return starts to tail off, but so do the drawdowns. There are many different variants on portfolio styles and options, and this is intended to be a very brief summary. But as a general concept, that's a useful starting point. Now, if you assume you have the right allocation for you, you diversified properly, you've got an optimum portfolio, and you're happy with the level of risk. Now, your final thing you need to know is probably investment structure. So investment structure. So the first thing to say is that the investment choices and mixes are seemingly endless. You can hold various assets direct, have funds, a mixture of funds, funds of funds. You can have funds that target certain asset classes and sectors. This is probably where the relatively simple concept of investing becomes a lot harder to grasp. As you're presented with a mixture of funds, investment options, uh, for example, an equity fund in a specific sector or geography or a bond fund, the list goes on. You can directly hold shares and bonds, but it's most likely that you might have a fund. And the fund may say accumulation, which means that the profits are reinvested to buy more units. So it's generally targeting growth or income, where they are surprisingly pay out an income. So options on investments, there's what's called indirect investments, which have the opportunity to diversify. And these are open-ended investment companies, OICs, unit trusts. Um, these are names for the UK version of what US are known as mutual funds. Open-ended funds means that the fund can or pool is divided into units. Units. Investors can buy or sell units at any time. As people buy units, the pool gets bigger. As they sell them, they get smaller. And that's what's meant open-ended. That can be seen as a good or a bad thing, depending on how you argue, because you could argue there's less control for the manager to control investment timings, or you could say there's more flexibility in mind with investor demand. There's also a slight difference between the pricing and underlying structure, but frankly, this video is already boring enough. So ETFs. ETFs are exchange traded funds which generally are traded like a stock, so they're considered very liquid and often have lower costs. In the UK, you don't pay stamp duty on ETFs and the pricing is updated throughout the day, which just solves a good thing, but frankly, if you care about intraday pricing, you're not really investing. There's also considerations around the structure of the holdings with the ETF. You've got physical holdings where the ETF owns the underlying assets. The return is generated using derivatives, which is synthetic. And there's optimization or stratified sample where the sample of the underlying holdings is taken. The big differences with ETFs is their in-kind creation and redemption process. And there's a link in the description if you wanna know more about this. People who like ETFs praise the fact that they increase price transparency, liquidity, and often offer a low cost solution for investors. Investment trusts. These are public limited companies and close-ended funds, which can sometimes, but not always, make them a popular choice for less liquid assets. So things like small companies or certain markets. The reason for this is the manager will have a bit more control of the flow of the assets because they're close-ended. They, they don't have to expand and contract as much as their open-ended counterparts do. The total sum of investment trust assets is called what's called the net asset value or NAV. Investment trusts can commonly trade higher than the NAV, which is a premium, or lower, which is called a discount, which tends to be to do with how well the investment trust is regarded or doing or the market sentiment. There's also scope for investment trusts to borrow or gear slightly more, which can be a good or bad thing depending on your view. So that is a very basic overview and hopefully provides you a bit of a help in understanding your investments. Next week, I promise the topic will not be as boring, but if you did enjoy the video and get it to the end, please do like and subscribe, just so it's not me in the box. See you next week. Thank you.